Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone. What a great thrill to see so many people out here today from near and far. I'm Steve Radlett. I'm the chief economist here at USAID. I'm standing in for Susan Reichley, who's our assistant administrator uh, for the Policy Bureau. She's on a plane, I think, arriving any minute, uh, so she wasn't able to be with us today. On Susan's behalf, I want to welcome you to this PPL Development Forum. This is the second development forum that we've had uh, this year. And the Development Forum is an opportunity uh, for all of us to stop our, our hectic work schedules and to come together and to meet with some of the world's leading development thinkers and practitioners uh, and to debate and discuss some of the major challenges facing us all uh, today. Uh, and today we are delighted and have the immense privilege of welcoming, uh, uh, welcoming to this forum one of the most courageous uh, people that I know and one of the great development leaders and thinkers uh, in the world uh, today. Um, uh, Administrator Shaw will give a, a fuller introduction uh, a little bit uh, in, in just a moment, but I wanted to relate that I had the great privilege of working with the president for four years as an economic advisor uh, in, in Liberia. It started, I got a phone call in November of 2005, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and I was sleeping and watching football games, I guess. Um, and the phone rang, and it was a mutual friend, uh, Steve Cashin. Uh, and I didn't know that my life was about to change. And Steve said that I was about to get a call from President-elect at that time, uh, Surly, to ask if I might be willing to help uh, with some of the reconstruction activities and to think about foreign debt and managing uh, donors out in Liberia. So I was delighted to take the call. She asked if I would, would come out and help with these things. We talked for a while, and I was immediately running through my head all the trivial things about, oh, what am I supposed to be doing next week, and I've got time commitments to do that, and I'm so busy, I, I'm not sure if I really have time to do this. But finally, I was smart enough to say, I'd be delighted to do that. Perhaps I can come out in six or seven weeks after the first of the year. There was a long silence. <laughs> she said, well, I was kind of expecting you might be able to come next week, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> and that started it. And uh, I actually counted a, a little while ago uh, through my passport for security clearance here. I took 26 trips to Liberia over four years, some was a week, some six weeks long. Uh, it was the most remarkable, the most rewarding uh, experience that I have ever had professionally and personally. And I had the privilege of working on donor coordination mechanisms, uh, uh, working on the very difficult challenge of Liberia's foreign debt and some other uh, issues. I want to just talk about one in particular, actually, that I did not work on specifically, but I think uh, really does illustrate some of the progress that Liberia has made. I, I had the privilege of seeing every time I came more economic activity, better health uh, facilities, better education facilities, the doubling of kids' uh, school uh, enrollments, uh, the turning on of power and water for the first time, and many other improvements. But I want to talk just for a minute about one specific small example or what might seem small, but that illustrates both the substantive progress and the uh, commitment to process reform institutional building and capacity building. It's in the health sector. One of the goals in the health sector was to increase the coverage of the basic package of health services, just a basic package of services that people could access through clinics or hospitals. Uh, and at the end of the Civil War, very few hospitals offered this basic package. Uh, but just to get right to the point on the substance, two years ago in 2009, 36% of Liberian health facilities uh, were equipped to provide this basic package of health services, 36%. Today, in 2011, two years later, that percentage is now up to 82%. In two years, it's increased from 36% of the health facilities to 82% of the health facilities. That means more people are getting those health services, more people are getting the treatment and the care that they need, and it means that they're saving lives. 
And we at USAID are deeply involved in supporting that process. Uh, and it illustrates the progress that can be made, but it's also supported by a unique institutional arrangement through a donor pooled fund that I think has great relevance to us as we think about USAID forward and our commitment to building systems and working in new creative ways. It's a pooled fund for the health sector, like many other pool funds, where donors could put their funding together. But unlike other pool funds, where donors want to manage this outside of the government and dole out the money to the government when they so choose, in Liberia, on the insistence of, of President Sirleaf and her health minister, Dr. Gwenangali, it was put in the Ministry of Health, absolutely geographically in, in the headquarters of the Ministry of Health, in the office of the minister. And they hired uh, an American guy, actually, to run and administer the program with a separate financial account so that there was fiduciary oversight, but that the decisions on how that money was allocated was done in, in conjunction with the Minister of Health. He made the decisions in discussion with senior staff so that those decisions in terms of partnership and country ownership were absolutely embedded, and it was a way to use that financial system to build capacity. And I make that point. It's a small thing, or it seems like a small thing, but I think it shows both the commitment to achieving development results and to building institutions and processes over time that can last. And it's the best of what we talk about in aid principles, multilateralism, building systems, uh, uh, and focus on results. And they were all uh, coming together. So this is a place where big things are happening in terms of economic growth and debt relief and, and achievements in health but also institutions and capacity is being built over time. So I just wanted to give you that as, 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 uh, as one example. Um, uh, as I said, it was a great privilege for the two of us to work together, and she did me the great honor of writing the introduction to a book on, uh, on Africa that I came out with a, a year ago. Uh, so I'm delighted uh, that she is with us here uh, today. But I wanted to now turn the floor over to Administrator Shaw, uh, who I know is also delighted to, to be here and to have President Surly uh, with us today. So let me turn it over to Administrator Shaw. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we are all so eager to hear from President Surly, so that I will just get right into introducing her. Uh, one of the great things about getting to work in this field of development, getting to be a voice for vulnerable people around the world, getting to be a partner with incredibly inspiring people around the world, is that you are touched and inspired by brilliant examples of courage and success and persistence every day. But it's not every day that you get to have one of those stunning examples come and speak with you and visit with us in this manner. And so, President Sirleaf, we are so excited that you are here. For those of you that don't know President Sirleaf's background, she has a global education, has been in the public sector, multilateral institutions, the private sector, in every situation has been a remarkable leader. Um, her 2009 autobiography is a story of courage that will inspire you. She's taken tremendous physical and personal risks to fight for her people and to ultimately become the first female elected head of state on the continent of Africa. And she is leading one of the most dramatic success stories in global development anywhere in the world. Uh, you just heard some of that success from Steve, and hopefully, President Sirleaf, you'll tell us the magic formula so we can be better <laughs> partners with you and with your counterparts uh, around the continent and around the world. I'd like to take this moment to also recognize Pam White, who was the brilliant mission director of an outstanding mission and her entire team. That team is now led by Patricia Radar. And either way, we are moving forward with uh, a package of assistance and cooperation, creativity and innovation in Liberia that I hope is a model for the types of engagements we can have all around the world. So special thanks today to the Africa Bureau and to that team for the excellence that you've brought to this relationship. And without further ado, I introduce one of the most inspiring people in global development, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Administrator Shah, for the opportunity 
to be here to exchange some views. And thank you, Steve, uh, for being also instrumental in, in getting me here. Uh, my purpose for being in this country is twofold. Um, for one thing, to continue our advocacy for the support for Liberia, and we've spent our time uh, with the administration and up with um, with the congressmen people talking to them about that and hope that uh, we'll be spared the knife. Um, and the other thing is to to go down to South Carolina and and join the uh, the celebration of one of our bishops who's going to be inducted into office as a presiding bishop, and I can use that opportunity for the prayers. We need that too. I want to thank all of you for being here, the great audience, and many of you in this room. We know some of you you've worked we've worked with. Some of you have been supportive of our endeavor. A particular uh, recognition of Betsy Williams. If Betsy is here, that's Betsy. Betsy spent some time with us, about a year or so, um, working with our health services. And there were times when, when we just worried about her and say, Betsy, you're too young to make this kind of uh, commitment and whatnot. But she, she stuck it out. And thank you, Betsy. And Molly Kinder was one of our one of our interns, our interns, and, and Molly spent some time working with us, and we just want to recognize her too. And, and then um, Carrie Radlett, who worked with our Ministry of Health, and she's helped to put those basic health packages together and, and support uh, Minister Guanagali in that. And uh, then there's Sheena Bolton, who I'm just getting to know, I understand she's in the administrator's office, and we're we're proud of you for having uh, having achieved that. Most of you know the Liberia story. Um, some of you have contributed to it. Uh, many of you have um, read about it. So some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, will be repetition, but sometimes repetition is good. Uh, so we make sure that um, it stays alive. And so I've been saying some of these things in some of my meetings in the last couple of days, and I'll be saying them again. Uh, Liberia started on this bumpy road, uh, well, 2004, when we, when we found peace after the cessation of war and an interim government was formed, and that interim government led the process for free and fair elections in 2005, and out of those elections, um, we were chosen by Liberian people to lead the reconstruction and the recovery effort. Um, we inherited, you know, quite something, you know, dysfunctional institution, collapsed economy, destroyed infrastructure, lack of confidence in ourselves and, and in our future. And so we started off by saying, you know, what do you do when the needs are so fast? Um, when the priorities are so many, how do you find priorities within priorities to get started? Ah, but we put, we put a great team together. Steve was was well, one of those who came on board once we got started. And, and we thought the first thing we'd do was to say, you've got to deliver something because race expectations were there. Um, Impatience was there. People wanted to be normal again. They wanted to receive basic services again. Our resources and our capacity to respond to those were quite limited. So we decided on 150-day deliverables and tried to identify critical things, like just turning the lights back on, uh, getting some water flowing in just a few pipes, uh, trying to get kids back to school. And so... Those 150 days led us to an interim poverty reduction strategy. And after that, a full-fledged, by 2008, a full-fledged a poverty reduction strategy. We centered all of those interventions around what we call our four pillars, and many of you may be quite familiar with them. Uh, first, peace and security. Um, obviously, you, you can't get anywhere unless you have stability. And that's the only way you, you create the environment to be able to work to be able to attract support, to be able to rebuild the confidence. 
Uh, that required us building a new army because our armies uh, had not been very functional and we had to build them from scratch, set, um, set particular standards uh, for participation in the army, start to do our full security sector reform. Um, today, we have um, a 2,000-person trained army, young, all of them quite able, professional, uh, well-equipped, very small in comparison to the vulnerability of our region and our nation, but um, a good start. And we're working on the rest of it, our police force and the other security apparatus still under reform, still under training. Um, that that army got the support from you, uh, came from the U.S. government. They were entirely in charge of training the new army with support, of course, from some of our neighbors like Nigeria, like Ghana, um, Benin that offered us training courses. And, in fact, today the commanding general of our army still is a Nigerian general as our own uh, officers have not reached a level of training to be in that position, but, you know, we're working on that. Uh, our second pillar was the economy. What, what do we do when things were no longer working for us? Uh, we centered on growth, that the only way you can address the issues, you can't distribute income if you don't have it. So we wanted to focus on growth that would produce the income, and and that led us to to trying to find our productive areas and to put them uh, to work again. Uh, we opened the economy. We attracted uh, direct foreign investment to the tune of some $16 billion in our something. As you all know, Liberia is not resource poor or resource rich. That are resource rich. It's just a matter of taking those riches and putting them uh, to good use with true efficiency in allocation, ensuring that they make the basic needs so. Um, with, with that, um, we, we've been able to, we were growing, we thought we were going to reach double digits. We, we reached 9.5 in 2008, I think it was, and then 2009, and the global financial crisis hit us hard, and so it dropped. But 2010, we've recovered to 6.4%, and I, I believe today we're, we judge to be one of the 20 fastest growing economies in the world, and we hope we can maintain uh, that momentum. The other thing on our economic revitalization was to um, to be able to tackle our debt. Uh, some $4.9 billion external debt not serviced for over two decades. And we worked on the HIPIC program with the support of the, the IMF and the World Bank. And on that program, in a period of three years, uh, that debt is virtually gone. Um, that enable us then to, to have a little more fiscal space. Of course, we also, our fiscal systems had to be put in order. And so we had to, we had a cash budget we could not spend and we spent only that which we were able to raise. Uh, by expanding our budget, it was 80 million when we started. It's uh, about 370 million, um, today, this fiscal year. And, and so with that, uh, we were able to begin to respond, uh, to some of the basic needs. Um, putting our public financial management, new procurement laws, all of those things that enable us to be able to use and allocate our resources uh, effectively. Our, our third was um, infrastructure and basic services, uh, rebuilding the roads, the schools, the clinics, the, the water, the lights, uh, all of those things that had really become non-functional. And we've come a long way also in that. Um, today, we can go in most places in the country uh, with roads. Uh, roads for us is a really high cost item because of our weather conditions. And so building roads is not easy for us. And unless you can really get paved roads that are to the standards where they are not affected by heavy rains, we find ourselves every year having to, having to rebuild those roads because they don't stand up. But We've, we've, we've done that and, um, we, we focus on education and education was a big, um, big issue for us. The quality of education. Most of the skilled teachers had left the country. You had volunteer teachers and many of them, you know, really well intentioned, but did not have the qualification. 
And so our kids would, were not, uh, we still, we still have problems with the quality of education because we still, so we've tried to, to, um, to re, reactivate our teacher training institutes and three of them are now functioning. And then, thank you, Carrie, we, were, we brought back the Peace Corps and the Peace Corps is focusing on teacher training. So they're actually manning those, those institutions and, and helping us to do that. We, we enforced, um, uh, compulsory primary education. Our enrollment has doubled, and most of the ones that part of that um, new enrollment are young girls because we've particularly uh, focused on on young girls. Um, governance and the rule of law, a tough one. Uh, when when our capacity was so low, our institutions were not functioning. So uh, again, we we try to put in the right laws and the strategies and policies and. Uh, we had an, we went for an open society where basic freedoms were respected. Our media was allowed, you know, to be free. We have a civil society, uh, that is quite, uh, aggressive, buoyant, uh, forcing us to be accountable. Um, we're trying to get the marriage system in place in our, in our civil service. And so all of those things have progressed. Um, corruption was, is always an, an, an issue, continues to be an issue. We've tried to look at that in a very comprehensive way to say there's the prevention and there's punishment. On a prevention, what we did was to strengthen our pillars of integrity, like the General Auditing Commission, Liberia Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, Freedom of Information Act, all of those things. Uh, make sure that we gave better compensation to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, put in systems. There were no systems. Make sure you have computerized operations, which did not exist. Uh, build capacity so people could understand the new procurement laws and the public financial management laws that were passed. Uh, but then there's punishment. And punishment is where we're still lagging because we, we do have a independent uh, judiciary. We can't fire judges by our constitutions. And so we have cases that stay in the courts. We've, we've lost many cases in the courts, but we continue to work on judiciary reform and continue to press that aspect of the fight against corruption, and we think that now that we've put in the measures of preventive, we can now concentrate on the punishment uh, and be able to move on that uh, to solve that problem. We still have challenges, uh, challenges of um, unemployment, thousands and thousands of young people, many of them child soldiers who did not have a skill, who did not uh, get an education. What do we do with them? Trying to train them, bring back their dignity, gave them a profession, but that takes a while to be able to, to achieve that. So trying to make them small entrepreneurs where they can be self-employed since we cannot absorb all of them, although we hope that the, the major investment we've made in our mining sector, agriculture sector, forestry sector will be the one that will absorb many of these young people. And we've got uh, very lively training programs for each of our concessions. Um, we, we still can have infrastructure problem. Like I talk about these uh, investment we've made, but these people can't operate if, if we don't have functioning ports, uh, if we don't have roads to enable them to, uh, to be able to take uh, the exports out. Um, and so we're still struggling with power, still struggling with roads, and our priorities on infrastructure are just that, uh, roads, power, ports, because they're so vital to being able to put our investment to work and to and to get the results that we want. Uh, there's so much that is lacking in power. You've again in all of these areas, believe me, uh, USAID has been very supportive. In all of the pillars activities, uh, you have been there with us. Um, you have sometimes been very diverse. Uh, I recall many times Pam would say, uh, "Well, you come and you see a USAID sign, and but you don't see anything behind that sign." Uh, but that's because, you know, some of the things you were doing are really the things that affect people at the bottom. Um, training people, uh, helping young farmers to be able to, to take their produce to market, those are not the big things. So many times when people try to compare uh, China, China's um, intervention with that of the U.S., I keep telling people that China goes for the big footprints, you know, the big stadium, uh, hospital, and school and that stands out and people look at that and say, oh, China is so aggressive, but 
those are not the sustainable things. Uh, so the, what we're building are the building blocks that really lead to sustainability in growth and development, and that's where uh, USAID and all of that you've done. You've all, all been in that. So we look to the future, and we feel confident that as far as we've come, we've laid the foundation, we've put all the fundamentals in place, and that we can now um, aim at our two major objectives as we move from poverty reduction strategy to our long-term perspective agenda, uh, we say that um, 10 years, we do not want foreign assistance. If we put all of our resources to work, uh, we are determined to move from dependency to self-sufficiency. Uh, and we think we can do it because our population is relatively small and our resources are ample. If we use them effectively and efficiently, we can achieve that objective. And our Minister of Planning and Economic Affairs here, who's working on the long term, says that the objective, second objective is to be a middle income country by the year 2030. And I tell him he'll be there maybe to see it, I won't. But I hope that working together, we can put it on an irreversible path toward the achievement of that goal. I must tell you one thing about Steve. You're going to have a lasting place in our in our nation's um, development history. And that's because at the end of our first fiscal year, we had a surplus. Oh, can you believe we today, Abir has a, budget, a fiscal surplus of 2.5% of GDP. I'm told that um, you've got yet to reach that. <laughs> The challenge, of course, is to make it last. Um, but, but at the end of our first fiscal year, we, we did have this about a million dollars in, in surplus. And normally, we'll take that and carry it forward to the next year or use it on something. And, and, and Steve's suggestion was, he said, why don't you give it back to the people? I said, what do you mean? He said, um, give it to the counties. Call it a special development fund for the counties. And so we started Counter Development Fund. And I must tell you that is the most appreciated intervention because that money is put in the budget, in their own names. The procedures for establishing priorities are done by them, and they did manage it. We ran into some bumpy roads on that because the capacity to manage it properly became an issue. But, um, but by and large, it's something that started a very good principle and that has involved a lot of our grassroots people being involved in the budgetary process, being involved in selecting the things they want that help them most. And so, Steve, your, your suggestion is something that we owe that to you, and I want to thank you. I want to thank all of you who've worked with us uh, over the years, many of you directly in country or in support systems here in other places, and just say to you that because of all of you, because of the support from the U.S. government, it's been as a number one partner standing by us in all those difficult times that have enabled us to achieve the progress that we have. Um, today our people have faith in the future, have confidence in themselves, and we are assured that Liberia is on a move and will achieve its objective. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I think, are these microphones on? Can you all hear us? Good. We have the opportunity for the president to take uh, some questions from, from everyone, so please think of your questions. While you're thinking, I'm going to take the liberty to ask the first one. And that is, President Sirleaf, when, when I'm on Capitol Hill or when I'm talking with uh, various parts of our country about this work of development assistance and foreign assistance and partnership with countries, there is a great deal of skepticism about whether our investments can be used productively and whether we see the kind of success stories that you're describing. And I was reflecting on the reality that 15 years ago, we had far fewer democracies in West Africa. 
you describe Liberia's growth path with numbers that we only dream about here in terms of growth rates, uh, and that there's a great deal of both money to be made and investment potential now in West Africa. I wonder if you could just talk to us about what do you believe is possible in West Africa given the emergence of new democracies and given some relatively rapid growth rates, as Steve wrote about in his book. Uh, and w what do you think that means West Africa might look like in 5 or 10 or 20 years? And what are the r biggest risks that you think the, that part of the world still faces? Um, if you look at Africa as a whole today and look at where we were, say, 10, 15 years ago, there's a major transformation that's taking place. Transformation based upon economic reforms that have been consistent over several years. So the growth rates of, of Africa, West Africa included, uh, have surpassed the growth rates of many of the other regions. Mm -hmm. If you look at the um, democratization process, as you rightly pointed out, 20 years ago we had only three democracies. Today we have well over 18 of them. And, and these, and many of them have reached a level of political maturity that they've had two or three consecutive transfer of power peacefully where people's choice have been respected. So that transformation is on. Um, we have not achieved as much in regional cooperation to be able to improve uh, you know, inter-Africa trade, and certainly in West Africa, infrastructure has been our main constraint. To, to be able to enhance the free movements of goods and people. But I'm, I, I'm convinced that in about a decade or two, that transformation for many of our countries will be completed. We see it at high levels. If you look at places like um, Rwanda, uh, Ghana in West Africa, um, the risk toward achieving transformative goals is that we could slip back into conflict. And most times the conflict are resource related. Um, the exploitation of resources, the criminalization of the economy have always led back to that. I mean, it's so easy to see in the Cote d'Ivoire case how quickly all the development gains can be reversed because you slip back into conflict. And so to prevent that, I think we need to do more regional work. Um, uh, I hope that, I mean, we're moving toward trying to move the effectiveness of aid, mm -hmm. and we hope that the U.S. Will, will, will see the wisdom in doing some of these uh, pool funds. It's worked so well for us in the health sector where it brings uh, much more harmony, much more coherence, much more effectiveness. If all work together toward common identify uh, activities and thereby able to scale it up and to get more results, um, I, I hope we can see you on a year administration, see you move in that direction. Me too. Um. <laughs> we, we, in all seriousness, we have uh, everyone here has heard about USAID Forward, and many are leading the charge. But we've reformed our procurement approach so that we can participate in pooled funds, okay. support other donors or multilateral institutions, and perhaps most importantly, enable a much greater proportion of our assistance to go in direct assistance. And we've built a financial management tool, and I believe Liberia, Sharon is right here, could, we just completed the assessment in Liberia, and okay. it was a very positive, as would be expected, result. And Sharon, do you want to say something about that? Well, uh, do we have a microphone? Can we get Sharon a microphone? Yep. Sharon is our administrator for Africa. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam President, it's an honor to be here and speak in front of you. Um, we are very proud of our partnership with Liberia. In fact, uh, Liberia was a pilot for our performance um, uh, financial management um, uh, rapid assessment. Um, and uh, as the administrator stated, um, Liberia has moved into a position to actually begin to see some of our funding flowing through your financial management system. Um, we are looking uh, in the near future, in the next couple of months, uh, up to $8 million or more flowing directly into uh, your system. And we're also looking to work more directly with some of the uh, uh, local partners. Um, so 
Liberia is a shining star in terms of USAID Forward, and we hope to continue that partnership and do much more with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, are there questions? And we can just put your hand up, and we'll have a microphone come around. There's one right here, and then we can go over here. Good afternoon, Madam President. Um, I, have a, I grew up in Sierra Leone, and when I was growing up, uh, there was the Manu River Union in the 70s and I think up to the early 80s, and it had a lot of potential for mutual development and economic growth, and then the conflict came, and I think it was for, reformed again. So I was just curious, uh, given the question the administrator had asked in terms, and your response in terms of regional cooperation, I was wondering what role do you see the current Manu River Union playing in the post-reconstruction of Liberia and Sierra Leone? The Manu River Union has been reactivated. As you know, originally it comprised three countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire has joined the union, so that completes the cycle of the four neighboring countries. Um, our resources in all of these countries are vast. Natural resources are there. Again, it's a question of how do we improve regional cooperation, connectivity, how do we have systems of power and roads and whatnot that can be interconnected. They, how do we identify um, countries with comparative advantages and, and take those to work so that we can have a larger market size, we can have economies of scale, uh, in, in some of those activities, we can move toward industrialization and away from the export of primary commodities. Those are the things we're now working on. I'm the current chair of the, of the Mono River Union, and now that we have peace, because there was always a problem, a regional war, and then you had problems in Guinea and then problems in Cote d'Ivoire, but now that we seem to have relative peace, which we're trying to, to maintain, that gives us the opportunity to do much more um, working with each other. And some things have started in the power sector. We have the West Africa Power Pool in which those with surplus and deficits in power will share with the others. Uh, we have our road transport. So it's, it's taken a while. We've been very nationalistic. Um, but I think we see the, the wisdom in, in working more regionally and the benefits that it can bring to all of us. And Madam President, I would just add one of the things we believe a bilateral aid institution can do, sometimes that multilateral development banks struggle with, is to program regionally. And we will be investing in using our regional missions more actively going forward to support these types of things. And in Africa, the, the regional missions have been very dynamic and have supported CADEP and the AU and many other great processes. Uh, but we're we are eager to hear your thoughts on how we can continue to expand that. Well, uh, I think we have a question over yes. here. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, my name is Shari Berenbach, and I head up USAID's microenterprise development programs. And I had the great pleasure in the early 1980s uh, to work in Nimba County with a partnership for productivity Liberia, which at that time was working very hard to bring entrepreneurship and uh, economic development to different parts of the country. Um, my question for you to, today really has to do with that whole issue of entrepreneurship and unleashing private sector development in Liberia. Clearly, uh, we work together as uh, supporting the government's efforts, but I'm wondering from your viewpoint, how do you think USAID can best support the Liberian government to encourage entrepreneurship and private sector efforts in order to stimulate the growth and objectives that you're trying to achieve? We need more business development service. How do we have potential entrepreneurs uh, to be able to understand markets, to access markets, uh, to know te technological changes that they can benefit sound management. Access to capital is important and has been one of the constraints, but to us that's not the major constraint. The major constraint is to be able to, first of all, to, to plan a business properly, uh, to prepare it, to make it um, feasible and bankable, and then after that to manage it. And so training in entrepreneurship is the way. It's going to be very important for us because 
Our traditional approach to development has been through large concession activities, mm -hmm. most of them extractive, mm -hmm. uh, operating in an enclave fashion. Uh, today, we want to make sure, first of all, that all of those companies have social responsibility and they have to do things in their communities. Um, but the next one is the linkage. How can we develop the, this small and medium-sized enterprises to do some of the outreach so that you don't have the, the uh, major concessions operating in a control environment as an enclave and thereby running the risk that when their operations cease, there's no sustainability. And that's where the entrepreneurship will come in because we've got to develop that core that will be able to provide these services and thereby enhance their own capacity and capability and make them a more vibrant participant in the economy. Can I ask a, a follow-up on that, a broader question about donors? If you could change one thing about how donors operate, what would it be? <laughs> Including us. Yeah. You've heard this before, but I, I, I have to say that as a short answer. Reduce the time from commitment to cash. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly in a post-conflict environment, you know, if it takes two years to, to get a disbursement. Absolutely. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have two groups that would love to comment on that if they're here. Uh, but if, if anyone from our OTI team or DACHA Bureau wants to speak about some of the work uh, that, that you all are doing to continue to be quick in disbursements, especially in post-conflict areas. OTI is a group we call the Office of Transition Initiatives designed to do just that, and we've been trying to invest in their growth. There's Rob. Thank you. <laughs> and then you'll have to go and be helpful. Right. There you go. There you go. That's your, the and price of admission. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, OTI actually initiated a program in Liberia uh, before the election and were there when you were president-elect and did some work with your office to help you arrange. Patrick F. and Pierre helped you arrange the executive office function. Uh, John Langlois helped set up a media center there. And we did quite a, few, uh, quite a lot of work for uh, about two or three years. And what we did there, we have uh, and learned, working with you and your new administration, we've now taken to other places, where prior to that, we largely focused on civil society and grassroots development in the post-conflict crisis. What we tried there with you and your government, we're now taking to other places, which is how do we really help centralized government function get up and running as quick as we can, too. And we agree with you, probably even more than you think, <laughs> that speed is of the essence when you have that golden hour and you really have to get things going, uh, lest you see it fall behind. So thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. We're looking forward to that to the result of your work. I think we have time for maybe one or two the last questions. Any other questions? This is not a shy group, so here we go, mm -hmm. right here. And then we'll go there, over there, and that'll be, <clears throat> that'll be it. Madam President, thank you um, for being here today. I am one of the Return Peace Corps volunteers from Liberia. Okay. I'm one of the first groups that went out working with the PTAs. Um, one of my questions, though, we've talked a lot about economic growth, and I was just wondering, in terms of basic services, I noticed a lot of the schools were still having water delivered. I mean, it was still a big challenge. I was out in Voinjima, mm -hmm. and I was wondering what types of programs you're working on or what your future goals are um, to make sure that there's more potable water, especially at the schools. We're trying to increase the number of boreholes um, around the country. We have a plan for, for installing pipe-borne water in some of the major cities, and that's being supported by the African Development Bank. Uh, sanitation is a big problem. Um, again, we have to change the way people build their homes and so that they have facilities within the, within the homes by being able to establish you know, housing standards by the same time having public facilities. We're doing more, more of those uh, in the community. Uh, we're trying to get our our local government officials to use their development funds for things like that uh, instead of, uh, as they prefer, building guest houses and uh, things. So it's <laughs> taken a while. <laughs> 
but it's taken a while, but um, we're beginning to do it. It is a real, it is a real need. There's no question about it, and we, we need to do more. And you know, we um, I, one of the things I didn't mention after thanking you, but we've got a lot of private initiative that has that has helped Liberia. We've established so many things. The Liberian Education Trust, under that program, private entities and private individuals here in this country, particularly have put up money for the for what we call the 5,500, 5,000. It aimed to build 50 or renovate 50 schools, to train 500 teachers, mm-hmm. and to have 5,000 scholarship for young girls. That has now completed its first phase and is going into the second phase, promoting literacy among our market women and trying to, to, to establish libraries. So we, we have the Surleaf Market Women Fund that have built markets or renovated and improved markets mm-hmm. all over the country. That's coming from private contribution. We have an innovative uh, uh, philanthropy secretariat in which we've established a unit that have tried to coordinate uh, our philanthropic uh, interventions so that they all be harmonized and they have annual meetings in which all the, the foundations come together and they determine where they're going to all work together collectively to be able to scale up some activities That has worked well to the point where we now think it represents a model that can be replicated in in other places. Um, The the support for us through the Scott program of the GCD, where where we have um, the Open Society um, uh, Institute on the the Soros Foundation has put up money to enable us to be able to bring people to, you know, and and to be able to give them more incentive to attract the really expert skills that... uh, that we need, the President's Young Professional Program, which, which Betsy knows that takes young people and, and pair them with the Scott Fellows. Mm-hmm. So all of these have been just uh, new things that we've done to, to be able to meet the, the, the vast needs and to be able to mobilize the kind of support that could not come from our own resources or from traditional sources. That's good. Well, we've tried to actually restructure some of our tools that we use to work with so we can engage more easily in public and private partnerships. And it's wonderful to hear about some of those innovations. I think we have time for one last question over here. If you'll please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Minty Abraham, and I actually was born and raised in Liberia, but left uh, after the Civil War. It's a pleasure to have you here, Madam President. Uh, I recently had the opportunity to visit Liberia after 20 years of being away, and it's remarkable in terms of how much has been accomplished over the last 20 years. Um, but one issue I saw and wanted to get your opinion on was what has been done to help the young women of Liberia. I saw so many young women with so much potential in Liberia, but I was a bit concerned in terms of like the activities they're engaging in to survive in a post-conflict environment. So what is the government of Liberia doing in consultation with other donors to address the needs of young women in Liberia? One correction. So much has been done in the last five years. Yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> A lot was done in the previous 15. But it was. <laughs> um, for one thing, education. As you know, traditionally, it's the girl child that gets left behind when there are not enough resources in the family. So just putting emphasis on girls' education. Of course, we found that retention it's a big problem um, to enable them to, to go the next stage, to, to enter tertiary, and to become a professional. Uh, because, again, poverty sometimes contributes to, uh, to prostitution, to leaving school, to getting married early. All of those things are the things that uh, we're, trying, we're trying to address. But as I say, most of the enrollment today are from the under the Millennium Challenge account, where we've become a threshold country. Uh, one of the one of the areas has to do with uh, retention, school retention, particularly girls. So the key is education. Uh, we, with that, we think, um, of course, we have very very strong women groups that are trying to address something like gender-based violence and all of those things. Uh, we should also help help the women. Um, and you know, I'm a strong advocate. I, I like to think I'm a good example so that, uh, so that uh, they will aspire. Today, many of the young people, the young girls now aspire to be president, you know? 
<laughs> so, and in order to do that, they've got to get a sound education. They've got to be qualified. They've got to have a profession. And I think that, that that's a good inspiration. We're working on it. Well, uh, that's a wonderful note on which to close because you are an inspiration to us as well. And whether uh, I didn't realize you'd be a specific inspiration on the point of USAID forward procurement reform, but I want to <laughs> thank you personally for your commitment to, uh, to that piece and highlight for everybody here that President Sirleaf said uh, that we should be working more aggressively on the direct assistance and the, the pooled funding mechanisms because ultimately USAID has this wonderful luxury of, of we're 8,800 people Everybody walks through the door every morning with a deep commitment to help those who are most vulnerable and who do seek that partnership and that support. And any time we have an opportunity to gain an insight to help us do that work better, we know we get better results. And in, with all of the difficulty of the environment uh, that you uh, fought for and inherited, the amazing success you've been able to produce in just five years is something that not only inspires us, but inspires the Hill, it inspires the American people, and it lets us have the confidence to know that paired with great, outstanding leadership, the kind of work that we do in, in support of your efforts can lead to real results. And we're just constantly trying to be out there and tell that story. I, I had a chance to be with President Sirleaf in London last week, and she kicked off an important meeting for the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. And that was another example of when our team came together and made a significant and bold uh, commitment that, right. that will help save four million children's lives. And right. so, so we're just excited to be a partner of yours and we take this as inspiration in the broad sense and in the very specific. <laughs> and we, we will return from here to our, our work uh, even more uh, energized to create a better USAID and to help create a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.